everyone and welcome to the FPL Family YouTube channel. Today I am joined by the lovely Kelly Summers who has had the busiest summer ever <laughs> jetting around with um, the England teams which must have been amazing and now back into full FPL mode ahead of the new season. Yes, um, it was a brilliant summer. Um, obviously, not quite as brilliant as we hoped with the final. Um, but I found myself now, even when picking my FPL team, I'm a little bit biased towards the England players. Not, you can see my draft there. Not, <laughs> there's not loads of them at the moment, but Saka and those kind of players, Saka, Shaw, have been totally brainwashed. And I'm having to remind myself, nope, we're not doing England anymore. We've <laughs> got to pick the best players in the Premier League, not just for England. It's, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because I do think that the Euros has given us a different insight this summer in terms of picking our FPL players. The same with the Copa America actually as well and, and in a kind of maybe lesser way, the Olympics, because suddenly you're looking at players in a different way and kind of seeing them perform in, in another arena makes you go, oh, I definitely know that they are a player that I want now for FPL. There's a flip as well, though, isn't there? Because um, I actually recorded the FPL podcast just before we were recording this, um, and Julian Ron made a really good point that he doesn't make too many, many good points, um, <laughs> that you need to be a bit careful with your teams at this stage. And the first thing I always say is, think who has had a really busy summer or who yeah. hasn't. So, for example, I've got an English player that, of course, didn't play in the Euros, the heartbreaking injury for Trent Alexander-Arnold. He was... I think he would have probably been in my team anyway because I think he would have had a really good Euros. Mm. But he was 100%. He was one of the first in my team because he's had a bit of a rest. Obviously, that's not to be said for him. But Greenwood at the moment as well. I know it's not consistent across the board because a lot of those players have played. But I think that's something we do also need to take into consideration this season because it was a kind of long season or condensed. Then the Euros, some of these players. I know Conor Cody at Wolves only had two weeks off. Of course, Conor Cody didn't play very much. But bear in mind, some of these players might be a little bit fatigued or might take a few weeks to go up to speed. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because there are a lot of players out there that have had a full pre-season with their managers, back with their clubs, and some of them are really stepping up and kind of being noticed. And when you kind of watch the pre-season training videos, you can kind of see the ones that have been around with their managers, particularly if they've got new managers as well, like it, like at Spurs. It's been fascinating to watch the pre-season training there because obviously some of the bigger names haven't been there because they've been away at the Euros, mm. the likes of Lloris and, dare I mention, Kane, but... <laughs> you know, those, those big hitters, they've been away. But then you look at the likes of Deli Ali, Lucas Moura, um, Reggion. They've been obviously back at, at base training the whole time with Nuno. And so they might be the ones that you kind of want to target. If, of course, you want to target Spurs, but probably post game week one, because it's a bit, it's an interesting yeah. start to the season for them. But let's start with your goalkeepers, because obviously there's some Watford bias coming from you. But I don't think that this is necessarily... Um, a what for bias thing like I actually in my current draft have mad. these I have them both must... in my draft mm. I just think that at the price oh. point they look great yeah that's the thing it's the price point I'll be honest um, I never normally have what for players in my team obviously I couldn't last year um, just because and also they're often struggling at the wrong end of the table <laughs> yeah and um, so it's often just the odd gem as we know in all of the relegation threatened teams there's not too many options it's the price point I didn't originally have them both I had Martinez he was actually one of the first people I put in you know that like when you first get your team straight away you're like right okay yeah. up Bruno Martinez I had Watkins and things like that and Martinez was one of my first in it was only when I I didn't even really look at his price it was only when I realized I had very little left in the bank and I I've never ever bought into the premium, premium goalkeepers I've never liked spending more than 4.55 million mm. I just I just don't like it I I like I know you can get so many points. I know a lot of the successful FPL managers do, but for me, that's not a tactic I employ. I then looked at some of the rotating fixtures with goalkeepers, so you can kind of play the one with a favourable fixture. But then you're guessing, you're guessing where the clean sheet's going to be. And there's a part of me that, for my own sanity, quite likes almost set and forget. I can play if I accidentally put Foster in. Obviously, Backham's going to come straight in anyway. Yeah, you've got a keeper that is going to play, barring a disastrous injury. That said. Watford's defence is a lot better than it was the last time they were in the Premier League. They've uh, brought in the likes of William Patrice de Kong, um, Sierra Alta, but he did get injured in the pre-season friendly the other day, actually. Um, they've got some really good fullbacks, Adam Messina, obviously brought in Danny Rose, who you know well, but and Kiko Femeni on the other side, who has been brilliant in, mm. in the past. I'm still just not quite convinced that that defence is going to get enough protection because there's question marks over the futures of Nathaniel Chalabar, Will Hughes, and... I don't quite know the midfield's going to be very new look, so I'm right. not convinced that defence is going to be particularly stable. That said, you're going to get save points. So at the moment, they're both in there because it works for the rest of my team. 
but I don't look at that and think, oh yes, and particularly even Villa up first, I think it's some of their attacking options. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not wild for it, so it will kind of just depend what happens with the rest of my team to what happens with my team first. I also think though there's a lot of teams that you wouldn't necessarily want to double up on a goalkeeper but with Watford yeah. because I don't feel like there's going to be masses of other players that I would want from Watford it feels okay to have gone for the double yeah. up there and I am kind of prepared that there is going to be some weeks where they just get one or don't two points. Don't have them in for Manchester City away. And that's the problem isn't going it? going to minus, minus figures and that's that's some and I, I joke about that the day we got promoted my mum texted me and said oh my god I'm already dreading Man City <laughs> Um, and as a lot of fan, you do. I mean, eight 0 six 0 The last two times we played them, not at Vicarage Road. Even at Vicarage Road, it was three 0 um, But yeah, it's. But you are. You can't. That's my fear that there could be some pummelings in mm. there. I really hope I'm wrong, and maybe there won't be. But they're two very, very good goalkeepers, so they will get save points. Yeah. Like it's probably to FPL managers that maybe didn't follow Watford's journey last season will be a little bit be a little bit surprised to see that Ben Foster isn't starting. He had a finger injury. That he played with for a while, then Backman came in, did really, really well. Yeah, I'm phenomenal. Still, he's brilliant. He's been he's been linked with Arsenal, mm. so he's a brilliant goalkeeper. I wouldn't be surprised though. I don't know. He'll obviously be tested way more in the Premier League, so I wouldn't write off at some point Foster coming in. So mm. they're two really, really good goalkeepers, and I think that also adds to the appeal of yes, they're playing in a team that could be battling against relegation. But they're <sighs> two good goalkeepers. They'll be two of Watford's best players. I think Watford easily stay up. There's my prediction for I you. We were, I knew why we were friends. Yeah, I, I, I've got I a real feeling right. about Watford this time around. So Watford are our local club. Um, I mm. absolutely have a bit of a soft spot for them. Um, I remember when we had our eldest, this is a real tangent, but when we had our eldest, Watford were playing an FA Cup match. Um, and from my hospital bed, I could hear them score and the crowd were going uh. mental. So I've ever since that moment had a bit of a soft spot for, for Watford. And I, I look at them this year and I, I'm not that excited by them going forward. Like there are some players in there like yeah. Saar, who I think is phenomenal. But equally, I think defensively, that's where the strengths lie at Watford. And so going with the two goalkeepers, to me, feels like a nice way I can save 0.5 and it's the value that that 0.5 has across the rest of my team that means I'm prepared to play a Watford defender against Manchester City or even against Liverpool um, when most FPL managers might go, are you mental? But I think the way that you use that additional saved money could mean it's worth it. Yeah. The defence then... the reason I've done it, so... Yeah, but your defence looks really good. Like, I, I must admit, like, when I see some of these drafts, I think, oh, that's interesting. But, like, you've got... Ben White in there, who I think is just a brilliant signing for Arsenal. Like, he made such a difference to that Brighton mm. defence last time around. I can see him having a similar stabilising effect on the Arsenal defence, which they really needed. They needed somebody like him, and they've they've gone out, they've spent the money on him. I think he's great. And then two absolute kind of gods of FPL from last season in Trent and, and Shaw next to him. Any worries about Shaw in terms of coming yeah. back from the Euros? I actually, so again, sure, the first people I put in my team were Trent, Shaw, Salah, Fernandez, they were pretty much, and Martinez. I think they were pretty much the first two I put in. I sure likely won't stay in now because of the concerns over getting up to speed, as we talked about before. There's a talk of a slight injury, I think it might be ribbing. Ribs, yeah, remember. broken ribs. Um, and also, there's then the concern if he's so highly owned, doesn't play for a couple of weeks. His price goes down. Mm. So, and I know that's not a reason not to pick someone, but it's, for me, maybe I could pick him up a bit cheaper in a couple of weeks. So, actually, and I, I really want to get Luca Dina in. Mm. And so, actually, that, for the start of the season, I might go without Luke Shaw. I just haven't mentally wiped <laughs> up the colours to get rid of him yet. <laughs> it's interesting, though, with him, isn't it? Because I think Tellers is injured as well, so there isn't an obvious replacement at Manchester United. Yeah. So, could Ollie just go... He's back in training. Like I've seen pictures of him training with Man yeah. Manchester United. So could Ollie feasibly say, "We need you to play, and therefore you will play"? But there's also the element of if you if he doesn't play for say a couple of game weeks at the beginning of the season, their fixtures massively turn from game week yeah. six onwards. And then it's like, well, you only wanted them for six game weeks anyway. If he misses two of them, then actually maybe you are better going with someone like Dina who's got really yeah. lovely run of fixtures also and therefore could have just as much opportunity for clean sheets and attacking returns because I suspect we're going to see him on more set pieces this time around with the kind of other other stuff that's been going on at Everton mm. this summer. Um, so if we've got Luca Dina on set pieces, 
has he just got as much attacking threat as Shaw? Yes, there's no price difference. So in terms of that, it's it's an easy fix, I suppose. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking at the moment. But it's just one of those where I think because there's so many drafts going around that you're seeing on social media mm. with Luke Shaw in, it feels <laughs> like scary. quite hard to get rid of him. Yeah, um, for sure. But I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that I will get rid of Shaw. Sure. Mm. Um, I'll get rid of Shaw. Sure. Uh, but... I'm just not ready to do it yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I think when looking at your midfield, you've got obviously Salah and Bruno in there, who I think, if you don't have them both, I just fear you're going to spend the whole of the season just hiding behind sofas, not wanting to look at the scores, because particularly in these open set I didn't fixtures. Have him. I didn't have Bruno against Manchester City. And it's stuck with me forever. Yeah. That was just, I remember, I can't remember how the game panned out, but I remember I was out. I remember being in the car. And then hearing what had happened and just your heart absolutely sinking. And I'm not ashamed to say it ruined my day. Yeah. Like I was just so annoyed with myself because it was one of those where I'd heard some experts saying some stats on him. And I was like, yeah, why am I sticking with it? Like so much money. And I never normally make those types of moves. Mm. I'm not really super impulsive like that. And I was really annoyed with myself. So I, I was slightly not concerned, but obviously the news about maybe not as many penalties next season, that will impact both of those. And I know it is a lot of money, but they're not going anywhere. I just they think can't. you can't... I mean, a lot of FPL managers have been talking about going for Sancho over Bruno. And there is a big part of me that really likes it because obviously the budget saving is huge. Yeah. So it's kind of like, well, I can spend the rest of that money elsewhere. It basically gives me Kane money for when I do eventually want Kane, which is what... you Eventually, you know you're going to want Kane, yeah. regardless yeah, of where yeah. he ends up. But there's too much drama at the moment. But with, with Bruno, I kind of look at him and I know that if I have Sancho and game week one's deadline passes, I'm going to regret it. Because it's not that I'll regret it's that having Sancho. It's feeling in tummy, isn't it? Yeah. It's that feeling in fear. Tummy, fear of like, Utter fear. It's part of me that when I make, when I make moves like that, I'm like, semi patting myself on the back going, well done for being so brave, Kurt. Well done. But then I'm actually, the reality is I'm actually going, you're an idiot. <laughs> because obviously yes. there's the risk and reward thing. If it goes well, you're laughing. But let's be honest. Like, and obviously it would be incredible, but... Really, the likelihood of that happening is, is still pretty slim. Yeah, um, 100%. And I don't think the high of that is worth the low of not having him when everyone else does. No, I was just going to have a look. So he's currently owned by 40% of the game. Well, nearly 41% of the game. And it's kind of like, well, if you start the season without a player that's owned by nearly 41% of the game and you don't have him... It's a catastrophe, particularly when you look at those fixtures. Like, there is yeah. huge potential that Bruno goes mental. And then Salah's owned by nearly 50% of the game, 48.8% of the years. Like, you mm. can't... I just can't see how you can go into the season without them because the damage that they are going to cause if you don't own them is massive. And I know that from an FPL perspective, we shouldn't always look at it in that way and we should kind of play our own game. But equally... I always think that the premiums are the ones that are kind of the non-negotiables and Salah and Bruno absolutely fall into that category mm. for me. And then it's the players around them that you use to create your differentials and the ones that can kind of spur you up mini leagues and that sort of thing. I also think that there is a time, and like I said before, I'm not the boldest FBR player, I also think there's a time and a place to do those bold moves. And I think yes. at the beginning of the season that is not the time to do it because yeah. at the beginning of the season you're almost sussing out what your other you, you say they're about not looking at other people but you do have to you have to yeah yeah it's about staying in staying in it if you like it's a bit like staying in the game it's kind of a tactical it is um, yeah battle. it's a hard climb if you're not you stay in it for the first couple of yeah you, that's the thing because you don't want to be say some of people captain salary and he scores a hat trick you're <laughs> oh, my math isn't great you're so many points behind already and you're then immediately you're paying catch up yeah and i i fortunately touch wood I've never had to play my wild card, my first wild card, really early. I love keeping it as late as I can. Yeah. Obviously, that's why we have the wild card. You need to use it. Use it. Don't just sit there and try not to use it. Just. But my other half had to use it in game week two last year. Yeah. I don't want to be that person. No. Nope. I just don't think the opening weekend of the season is the time to go rogue, unless unless you're not as not going to be as affected as the likes of we would be if it did go wrong. Well, this is the thing, and I also think with Sancho being so much cheaper, if it is Sancho over Bruno that performs really well it's really easy to make that change but it's much harder yes, to go exactly. the other way and that's the way I yeah. always look at my team and that's what I like about your team here is that there's price points across it so there's easy moves from premium players to others there's those kind of mid price players because you've got Greenwood in there who can go anywhere you can go pretty much anywhere from Greenwood so Greenwood Greenwood probably is interesting to come to next because Greenwood probably won't stay okay I basically I have to do a bit of a juggle 
yesterday, so recording this on the Thursday when the Dunnings news broke yesterday, I, like the rest of the world, and what was it, 40-odd percent of the of managers, yeah. had um, had Watkins. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to stick with Watkins and Wendy, especially against Watford, but I probably would have. However, I then went to Calvert-Lewin, he's, what, 0.5 more, I think? Yes. So it's yeah. only 0.5 more, but I... Was I was hoping at one point I thought I was going to struggle things to have Fernandez and Sancho. Okay. Um, I would have had the world's worst defense, and it, yeah. So it, it, but basically, I just I then can't decide whether I keep I downgrade Greenwood and have a six point five million midfielder because mm. I think there's a number of really really good options. I actually think that's where differences in leagues will come early on. I agree because I think a lot of people will go Salah and Bruno in the end, and then I think it will be I think Buendia will be popular, but then some people I've seen drafts with. Saka, he's been in mine. Star, Deli Ali, even I think Mason Mount's a little bit more, but there's some really interesting players at that price point. Mm. And, so I, and there's the I've Leeds boys. In, but, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think he'll stay. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that 6.5 ish category offers some such great value. So you've already mentioned Buendia, who those opening three fixtures look brilliant for Villa. Couple that with the fact that he's now got an out and out striker ahead of him in Danny Ings. Mm. And they've got the new boy, Bailey, as well as Watkins still there. So suddenly they've got, even without Grealish, they've got this spearhead, which looks really good going forward. So yeah, yeah. particularly those opening games, I think Buendia is really good. But the, the great thing from him is that after game week three, when the fixtures do look harder, that you can go anywhere. Like you've mentioned those guys already. There's also Rafina and Harrison at Leeds, who both look like great options. Yeah. And Harrison's going to save you 0.5 because he's only 6 million. So there's definitely potential there. Um, there's also Embru- Embuno, Embuno yeah, yeah, at, Brennan, at Brentford, Brentford yeah. who I think is going to be hugely overlooked because everyone's going to go Tony. who will come on to in a minute. I had him in my first. I had him in my first draft. Yeah. But then I decided to go Tony, and I'm just not bold enough to go for two players in a newly promoted team. Yeah. So for me at the moment, I think my midfield is set as Salah, Bruno, Wendia. The last place is up for up for grabs. Yeah. Um. Because I either downgrade a bit and then I could upgrade Gibbs White. However, just a word on Gibbs White, I've kind of been keeping across Wolves' pre-season games, and for four point five, he looks there great. There's a chance he could start in that number ten role. Yeah, and I won't start him very often, as you can see here. I'm going to go three four three most of the time. It's my favourite formation, really. Um, so I don't know if I, how often I play the big midfielder, but so I know a lot of people have gone for Brownhill mm. and. That's maybe I don't know if that's a safe option or not, but yeah, Gibbs White I think will stay in there at the moment. So, but whatever I do with that Greenwood role, if I downgrade to six to a six million, mm. say, then I've actually I could go up to another six million with Gibbs White. I, I don't know, but yeah. yeah, that's that's kind of where that midfield's at. And I think th- I think four of those five are pretty set. It's just Greenwood really. Yeah, because it's interesting. I I actually really like Gibbs White at the moment. I'm on Billy Gilmore uh, for the same sort of reasons. Mm-hmm. Obviously, going to replace yeah, Ollie yeah. Skip at, at Norwich. We do have some concerns about Norwich, um, particularly in these opening four fixtures, but then I don't want to play him in these opening four fixtures, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, I do would want to play him, however, from game week five through game week 13, where the Norwich fixtures are ridiculous. But then equally, I'm looking at Tony thinking, well, if you haven't performed quite as well as I'm hoping, I can see you becoming pooky from game week five onwards. So, yeah. And then I can see myself kind of making those changes and it's it's being able to kind of think that long term I think that makes such a big difference because that will help protect wild cards it's it's looking isn't it because when you talked before about you want to get Kane at some point and you've got to work out you've got to hold your transfers to work out how you can combine players to downgrade two players to get there but also it's like actually if I go Wendy like like the rest of the world use Wendy for example because he'll definitely Mm. start I'm definitely going to keep him I know that if he flatters to deceive there's so many like for like it's very very easy yeah. for me to go well actually in a few weeks when Spurs are to turn I think that's a straight swap for me yeah that's fine yeah um so yeah it's kind of it's kind of about being smart it's something that I wasn't as good at and I'm getting better at is like the long-term planning and I think that's the difference that kind of tends to make the difference between the FPL managers that yeah. do really well at start or the FPL managers that start the season and don't finish because you get yourself in a bit of a yeah it's hard and I think you know I always have always a a bad game week one I, it never goes well because I kind of spend more time thinking about my team for game week two three four five so that I'm not having yeah. to panic about wild cards and I'm kind of already have an idea in my head about who might my transfers be um and so then obviously I don't stick necessarily rigidly to them but in my head I'm kind of like well the fixtures change for this player here so like Wendy is in mind but my fixtures change here so who would I get in his place and there's all that kind of thought process that goes along so 
by doing that, I think it, it puts you in a nice position moving forward into the rest of the season. And it means that likely you can benefit more from price rises as you're getting on the right players who mm. are likely to come into a nice wave of form um, a bit later on. Well, not that later on, but, you know, a couple of game weeks into the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then your front three, I think, is really nice. So Calvert-Lewin and Tony and Watkins were my front three until yesterday's Danny Ings news. And now I'm kind of having a bit of a debate with myself because Antonio was my next pick. But I've also kind of talked myself into really liking the idea of owning Danny Ying. So are these three going to stick, do you think, or is there potential for change? I think Tony was one of the first in my team. He will stay. Calvert-Lewin will either stay as Calvert-Lewin or go to Rich Arlison, just maybe if I want to save the money. I really like Everton's fixtures. Mm. I think the open day fixture is, is good, given kind of the worries that I know the nightmare. about Southampton. Yeah. Um, depends, they've still got some time to recruit. Um, so yeah, Tony will stay and Everton forward will stay. And Tony, I didn't have. So originally, who did I have him? I can't remember who he was, but Antonio came in a couple of days ago mm. just because I really, really like him as an asset and we know how explosive he can be. 100%. I'm a little bit worried about if West Ham bring another striker and the fact that their focus isn't just on the Premier League this season. And with his injuries, mm. when you play, where, where will their priorities lie? Um, that said, I've kind of been persuaded, I think, by the FPL community that he's a really good pick for that price. And I yeah. think with the fixtures, I'm willing to take the risk. Yeah. But with the knowledge that I might have to get rid of him if it doesn't go to plan. So the, the good I thing, think, I think they'll stay. The only other one I would like to say as well is I'm considering Callum Wilson. But yeah, we can talk about that. In a that is rogue, Callum Wilson. I think the, the thing with Antonio is his price, his fixtures change around the time that Europa League kicks in. And around the time that Pookie's fixtures get much better. So there's definitely movability yeah. with him. Like you can go to a number of places. Callum Wilson is fascinating to me because if he played anywhere else, I'd kind of get on board with you with it. But I'm just not That's sure about this Newcastle team. That's what holds me back a little bit, I think. The fact that we know they don't score an abundance of goals. I think he scored 12 last season mm. um, in a team that isn't renowned for its attacking prowess. They don't set up yeah. um, to kind of get the best visibility. But I think. I used to work with Callum when I worked at Bournemouth, so I know him. I know him vaguely as well. So I'm a little bit biased. He's the type of striker I love watching. Yeah, I so agree. I'm, I'm aware. I'm kind of letting my heart read my head a little bit here. But I read an interview that he did with Alan Shearer the other day, where he talked. He's got the number nine shirt this season. He talks about his, this relationship he's got with Joe Linton, about playing in front of the fans at St James's Park and mm. scoring in front of them, and how amazing it was. I think it was Stoke or I can't remember where they was Stoke, where they played in a pre-season friendly and he scored. And he talked about like the roar of the crowd. So I, I just feel like that's actually the environment for him to thrive. He talks mm. about wanting to score twenty goals. That's I'm aware that is the most emotional answer you'll ever hear me give about yeah. a girl. So I, and I think that is what will hold me back because I actually think that Antonio and Tony are better options and and an Everton striker. Mm. But Rich Charlison, being a Watford fan, I still I still quite like him. The good and thing I about Callum points loss. The good thing about Callum Wilson is you don't have to. You don't have to do that straight away. Like he's not going up or down in price. So if he does yeah. well, you can just get on him at that point and use him as a bit of a bandwagon. He has a really good record against West Ham as well, which mm. I think also, also in my mind always scores against them. Um, but like you said, it's 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 key not to get drawn into that yeah. opening fixture and and be blinded by that because all of a sudden if he does nothing in that fixture and you're like, oh well, I, I bought him in for that fixture. Yeah. You you're already making a transfer. So 100%. I think it's likely that I, I won't have him in. Um, but it's, it's it just like in the back of my mind, shall I? Yeah. No, I don't think I will. Before I let you go, word on captaincy for game week one. Who of this motley crew is getting the armband? Well, so, um, Calvert Lewin has it at the moment. <laughs> I have no idea why. Um, because Calvert Lewin doesn't even have a guaranteed place in my team. Um, <laughs> it will be Mo Salah. Um, it would all. It, the likelihood is most weeks it's going to be Salah or Bruno. Yeah, really. I think so. I think those two and Manchester City are going to be the three stand-up teams. I think I really like Manchester United's recruitment. I wonder if Manchester United's recruitment could eventually maybe affect Bruno and maybe he won't be the asset mm. he was last season because he won't need to carry them, so yeah. to speak, as much. Could be. Um, but, but I'm going into the season fully expecting Salah and Bruno to be my most captains. On paper, I actually prefer the Leeds at home fixture just because it's at home for United. But Salah away against Norwich. Looks too good, doesn't it? <laughs> it's just actually when I say Man United leads at home of course Norwich away is a better fixture um, I think you've got some really nice stats actually on how we do yeah I rattled them out to you before off, we started recording which yeah. made me feel better that's confirmed <laughs> it to me because I was a bit split before 
<laughs> yeah, he's he scored in every opening game, every opening day game for Liverpool since he joined the club. And Klopp's Liverpool have scored in every opening day fixture. We've scored at least three in every opening day fixture since he's been manager. So I can't, you can't overlook Salah, I think. I just don't want to start it's be, behind. It's going to be a Mane hat trick, isn't it? Probably. It's going to be a Mane Probably. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for joining me. I am very excited. I'm going to be seeing you next week at Fest. So if you haven't got tickets for Fest, Kelly is hosting. It'll be amazing. Come along. Um, and then I'll see you for some FPL shows in the coming weeks. Thanks ever so much for joining me. Thanks for having me.